In 1803, when the transportation of British convicts to Australia is at its height, an attempt is made to start a settlement in Port Phillip Bay at modern-day Sorrento. The mission is doomed to failure because of a lack of an adequate water supply. But before it relocates to Van Diemen's Land, modern-day Tasmania, and starts the settlement of Hobart Town, a handful of convicts escape their captivity by fleeing into the bush. Among them is a 6 foot 5, 23 year old former soldier named William Buckley. With the nearest sign of civilization at the time being the convict colony at Sydney, more than 850 kilometers away, and with no maps or supplies, the men are given up for dead. Later, when the settlement of Melbourne has just begun, and a base camp for the settlement has been set up at Indented Head on the Bellarine Peninsula to await the return of supplies from Van Diemen's Land. A stranger walks into the campsite. Whoever it is, is a giant of a man. He has long white hair and a long white beard. He's dressed in possum furs and carries two spears. It is William Buckley. He's been away from civilization for so long, he's forgotten how to speak English. This is 1835. He's been living in the wild with the Watharong Aboriginal people for 32 years. Addendum Throughout this podcast, I have sometimes referred to Aboriginal people by the terms Aborigines or Natives and used the words civilization and tribes. I've since learned that these terms are considered offensive by many Aboriginal people as they are loaded with connotations of superiority and disrespect. So I would like to apologize for using these terms as part of the narrative. It is not my intention to disrespect or cause offense to anyone in the making of this podcast. For the next part, I will not use these offensive terms as part of the narrative. William Buckley was born in 1780 in Macclesfield, Cheshire, England. He had two sisters and a brother, and his parents were farmers. However, he was adopted by his mother's father, and at the age of 15, was apprenticed as a bricklayer to a Mr. Robert Wyatt. Buckley clearly didn't enjoy his lifestyle because at the age of 19 he ran away and joined the Cheshire Militia. He describes receiving a bounty of 10 guineas for this and remembers thinking this amount of money would last him forever. After a year his money had exhausted and he volunteered in the King's Own Regiment of Foot at Horsham in the south of England, a long way from his native Cheshire. After only six weeks here, his unit was ordered to embark for war in Holland, where the Duke of York was in battle against the French Republic. Buckley's regiment, under the command of the Earl of Chatham, suffered heavy losses in this battle, and Buckley's hand was severely injured, although he doesn't detail how this injury occurred. On returning to England, Buckley received another bounty for extended service. He details how his officers had a good opinion of him because of his height, 6 foot 5, and his good conduct. However, soon afterwards, he fell in with a bad crowd he had met in the regiment and was arrested for committing a crime. Buckley always maintained his innocence in this affair, saying that a woman asked him to deliver a bolt of cloth for her, and then he was placed under arrest for receiving stolen goods. Buckley was found guilty in court and after this sentence, he never heard from his family again. As a prisoner, he initially worked on fortifications being built at Woolwich, but as a mechanic, he was identified as possibly being useful to a new penal colony that was to be set up at Port Phillip in what was then New South Wales. Buckley saw this as an excellent opportunity to redeem his sullied name, and so he embraced being sent for transportation to the other side of the world. This is remarkable when you consider the hardships that often went hand in hand with a marine trek to the Antipodes. A journey from England to what was called New Holland at the time took the best part of a year to complete, and trips were often arduous affairs that often involved the deaths of upwards of 10% of those who embarked. This is not to mention the exceptional remoteness of the colonies, 
The convicts were expected to build infrastructure when they arrived in a complete wilderness. It would be akin to a modern day prison ship being sent to Mars to build a settlement. This fact says a lot about Buckley's character, that he was willing to embrace his transportation in order to redeem himself. Furthermore, prisoners were often treated cruelly in a time when severe punishments were the rule. Lieutenant Colonel David Collins was chosen to lead the expedition and to be the governor of what was to be the first settlement in modern day Victoria. They set sail in two ships, the Calcutta and the Ocean. Buckley mentions how he was treated well on the journey and spent most of the time helping out the crew. When they arrived, the ships anchored two miles within the heads at a place Collins named Sullivan Bay. This site was chosen as a penal settlement because it was over 600 miles from Sydney, which meant escape would have been practically futile. Marines and convicts landed and encamped, and Buckley mentions how, while most of the convicts had to camp inside a line of sentinels, he and the other mechanics were permitted to camp outside it, and they were set to work on the first buildings of the settlement. Life, however, was tough at the new settlement. There was no access to a reliable fresh water supply, and the soil proved poor for growing crops. So after three months of roughing it, Buckley and three others decided to make an escape from their bondage. Buckley, in 1852, freely admitted to the madness of this plan, as it involved walking to Sydney, 600 miles to the north. With no maps, though, and no idea of which direction Sydney lay in, the attempt was utterly futile, and perhaps speaks of the desperation he felt at the time, especially considering the settlement was attempting to survive on brackish seawater. Buckley and his three companions had been entrusted with a gun to shoot kangaroo with in the area they were working in. One dark night they absconded with the gun, an iron kettle, and as many supplies as they could take. They were spotted, however, by a sentinel who shot at them, taking down one of Buckley's companions. He never found out if this man survived, as he never heard from him again. In fear for their lives, the three remaining men ran for three or four hours before stopping for a break. Not long after renewing their march, they came to a river, now known as Balcom Creek, in Mount Martha. At daylight, they began to renew their trek when they encountered a party of natives. This was the first encounter Buckley had with any of the natives that we know about. He says he fired the gun in order to scare them off, and they ran into the bush. That night, they reached to about 20 miles from the modern city of Melbourne and continued their way up the Mornington Peninsula, crossing the Yarra River the next day. After this, they headed away from the coast and travelled through vast plains until they reached the Yawang Hills. Here they finished the last bit of bread and meat they had taken with them. As they were incapable of finding any food, Buckley told his friends they must return to the bay to find shellfish or they would die of starvation, and they agreed, so they returned to the coast after what Buckley called a long and weary march. They were able to subsist off shellfish travelling down the west coast of Port Phillip Bay through the areas of modern-day Corio and Port Arlington. But life was becoming a serious struggle. By this stage, the men had been gone for a few days. They were thirsty, tired, suffering from diarrhoea, and they had started seeing native huts dotted around the place. The indigenous people who lived in the area at the time, known as the Watharong people, were a nomadic hunter-gatherer people, much like the other Australian indigenous peoples. They would often build these temporary huts made from bark and tree branches, and then they would abandon them, or perhaps come back to them at a later date. So these three European men were seeing these types of huts around the place, but they were not occupied. Buckley and his companions must have felt great fear at the prospect of bumping into these tribes as they referred to them. The common early 19th century trope that was in the backs of their minds was that these were untamed savages who would eat them as soon as greet them, so it can be imagined that they were somewhat concerned about this inevitable meeting. But apart from the meeting they had had on their second day from the settlement on the other side of the bay, in this area they were only encountering vacant huts. The next day they reached an island the Watharong called Barwal, which is called Swan Island today. Buckley mentions how they could reach the island during low tide. Even today, if you look at Swan Island on Google Maps, you'll see that the island is separated from the mainland by a very narrow strait of water. Melbourne sits on the northern tip of a large bay, but the point of entry to the bay is a very narrow strait at the southern end. 
The Calcutta had anchored just inside the eastern head of the bay, and so the three escapees had walked around the entire length of the bay from the eastern head to the western head, a journey of well over 100 and close to 200 kilometers. From Swan Island, which lies just inside the western head of the bay, they could actually see the Calcutta at anchor on the other side, as the bay considerably narrows the closer to the heads you get. So these men were exhausted, dehydrated and hungry, and in their minds they were in danger of being captured and potentially eaten by roaming packs of savages. Suddenly the prospect of returning to the settlement started to look appealing. Sure, they might be punished, they might have their sentences lengthened, but at least they would have a roof over their heads and something to eat and drink, and didn't have the threat of being cannibalized at any moment hanging over their heads. Buckley relates what happened next, quote, the perils we had already encountered damped the ardour of my companions, and it was anxiously wished by them that they could rejoin her, meaning the Calcutta. So we set about making signals by lighting fires at night and hoisting our shirts on trees and poles by day. At length a boat was seen to leave the ship and come in our direction, and although the dread of punishment was naturally great, yet the fear of starvation exceeded it, and they anxiously waited her arrival to deliver themselves up indulging anticipations of being, after all the sufferings they had undergone, forgiven by the governor. These expectations of relief were, however, delusive, and when about halfway across the bay, the boat returned, and all hope vanished. We remained in the same place, and living in the same way six more days, signalising all the time, but without success, so that my companions, seeing no probable reply, gave themselves up to despair and lamented bitterly their hopeless situation." End quote. Buckley goes on to relate how at the end of the next day, his companions decided to retrace their steps around the bay and return to the settlement. He spells it out thus, quote, To all their advice and entreaties to accompany them, I turned a deaf ear, being determined to endure every kind of suffering rather than again surrender my liberty. After some time we separated, going in different directions. When I had parted from my companions, although I had preferred doing so, I was overwhelmed with the various feelings which oppressed me. It would be vain to attempt describing my sensations. I thought of the friends of my youth, the scenes of my boyhood and early manhood, of the slavery of my punishment, of the liberty I had panted for, and which although now realised after a fashion made the heart sick, even at its enjoyment. I remember I was here subjected to the most severe mental sufferings for several hours and then pursued my solitary journey. The listener may be wondering at this point what Buckley was doing on the western side of Port Phillip Bay, considering he was trying to reach Sydney. The elder Buckley wonders this himself in 1853, and reflects at how futile the quest of his younger self was. On the first day of his solitary wanderings, one of Buckley's greatest fears was realised, in that he encountered a group of about a 100 Aborigines, in and near some huts made of bark and branches, and some of them made towards him. Fearing for his life, Buckley jumped into a river with his clothes on whilst carrying his fire stick. Luckily the natives didn't follow him into the river, but in quickly jumping into it all his clothes were drenched and he no longer had any means by which to start a fire to keep himself warm. He had to sleep on the bank of the river that night in wet clothes in early spring, which must have been close to unbearable. The next day he returned to the beach making sure he wasn't seen by the natives. He continued on up the coast, subsisting on what the Watharong called Kudaru, which we know as abalone, which was abundant in the area. If we look at the direction Buckley was travelling in at this point, we will see that he was actually going in the opposite direction of Sydney, his supposed destination. He passed through the Karaf River, and the river that passes through modern-day Torquay at, at the beginning of what is today the Great Ocean Road. Buckley was just travelling further into the wilderness. Adding to Buckley's suffering throughout this time was the fact that water was hard to come by. On top of this, when he ate the abalone, it made him thirstier. He would have to rely on the dew that collected on the branches in order to survive. Sometimes he would spot the abandoned huts of the natives. At others he would see wild dingoes, and their howlings haunted him at night. He continued travelling along the coastline in a southwesterly direction, passing through the areas of modern-day Anglesey and Aries Inlet. Luckily he found the natives had been burning the bush here and managed to procure a fire stick for himself. At this location he also found a native well, some berries and bushes and a great supply of shellfish which he was able to cook on his new fire. 
Buckley talks of giving up great thanks to God for this because he had been growing weak all the time due to the conditions he had been living under. He continued on down the coast and two days later came to Mount Defiance, which the natives called Nuraki. Here he decided to settle down for a while as his body had begun to break out in strange sores, probably as a result of suffering from scurvy from malnutrition. He created a more permanent shelter and found some edible plants nearby that could sustain him and stayed in the area for a few months. Thank you for listening to the first part of this episode on William Buckley. My name is Eamon and I'm the creator of Melbourne Marvels. In researching for this topic, I've mainly been relying on the life and adventures of William Buckley. This book, although written from the perspective of Buckley, was actually ghostwritten by a Tasmanian newspaper editor by the name of John Morgan in 1852. It is widely considered the most accurate account of Buckley's life. However, there are contemporary newspaper articles which differ in some key respects in the retelling of Buckley's story. What is clear though, is that this version is the story he was most happy with. Also, it is difficult to tell at times whether the account that is being related is truly Buckley's voice or whether it is Morgan's. For example, in the postscript of the book, Morgan reveals the contemptuous attitude he has towards the Aboriginal people and what he considers their lack of a civilised culture. We know that Buckley did his best to ensure the best treatment for the Aboriginal tribes once he returned to the colony and eventually left for Tasmania disenchanted with the lot they were given. This was part one of Buckley's story. The next part will be about the long time he spent with the Wadharong tribe. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Melbourne Marvels. With this podcast, I want to share some of the incredibly interesting stories that have happened in the Melbourne area. I'm a complete amateur when it comes to audio production, so I hope you can forgive me for the lack of quality. I would like to thank the musicians who have contributed to this episode. The current track is by a great Ukrainian music producer known as Kellowin on freesound.org. You can find more of his stuff on SoundCloud under the name Dead Tubes Foundation. Earlier, I used a choral piece by a guy known as ERH on freesound.org. I highly recommend you check their stuff out. Please also check Melbourne Marvels out on social media. You can send me an email on melbin marvels at gmail.com and you can like my Facebook page, Melbourne spelt like the city, Marvels. I'm also on Twitter as at melbin marvels. Don't forget to subscribe to Melbourne Marvels on however you listen to podcasts, whether iTunes or an Android podcast player. I would really appreciate if you could give me a five-star review on there too. And if you really feel like helping the show, you can find me on Patreon to make a donation. But no pressure. I hope to launch a website soon to complement the show, so stay tuned for details of that. Thanks again for taking the time to listen to part one. Stay tuned for part two, which will be released next week.